Okay, we're all good. Let's do it. Hello and welcome to the B2C Lead Generation Podcast. You're listening to the B2C Lead Gen Podcast. My name is Daniel Hopewell here with Simon Delaney, and this is episode 111. How the human element of call centers increases sales. And today we are joined by Nev Doughty from Contact Center Panel, who is going to help us look at call centers through the perspective of arguably the most important part, the people working there. Nev, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How about yourself? Not bad. Yeah, we're uh, we're good. Thank you. Yeah, we've just kind of just gone past this sort of mini September heat wave and uh, into autumn now. We're ready to ready to plow on. Um, so you're from Contact Panel. Uh, what is it that you do there? Can you explain your role to the people listening? Yes, yeah, so I've um, supported Contact Centre Panel for the past four years. Uh, effectively, I'm there to help both our outsource partners who are on the network and our clients get the most out of their relationships. So it's it's quite a privileged position. I get to be sort of the third wall. They, um, you know, both parties can bounce things off me. Um, our end game is just making sure that, that both the, the clients and the outsourcers are getting the, the best out of the, the relationships. So um, pe- people can come to us with all sorts of weird and wonderful problems and um, we'll talk them through and try and help them. And who do you get the most problems from? The outsourced partners or the clients? Well, controversial question. Do you know what? It's many and varied. I, I used to have a client who literally would ring me up on the way to a um, a monthly review and say, I'm thinking about discussing this with the outsourcer today. How would you position it? Um, and sometimes, you know, I've had the outsourcer ring me up and go, the clients just said they want me to offload those staff for December and January because there's nothing to do. And at which point I'm sort of ringing up the outsourcer and going, really? Uh, you know, uh, sorry, ringing up the client and going, really? Would you do that to your own people? And it's like mm. no but, but they're outsourced so and it's like yeah but come on um so you know it's it's just helping helping people find a way through it might be worth just um as clarifying what those roles are because not everyone might understand what an outsourced partner is so the outsourced partner is the contact center and yep. the, the client is the advertiser or brand typically which is then um using that contact sense to make sales or customer service or whatever it is yeah. they're doing them. exactly that so you know if, if you think of the you know the, the end product or brand that you would see that's the client and yeah the, the outsourcer if you like that's the hidden service provider the the people who are bringing in the people to make the magic happen yeah oh well See, I think uh, listeners to this show are, are typically more on the the brand side, so we're going to yeah. sort of a- ask a few questions on their behalf. Um, and obviously, being in the middle, you can answer sort of both sides of it. Um, but one question I was, I was speaking to somebody about, so I was going to talk to you, and he was talking about how post lockdown, um, it's harder to find agents who are willing to work in call centers um, compared to like the shift to sort of working at home. So I wanted to see what you thought on that. And also just to add a bit more to that, do you think there's a difference in terms of quality between the agents who work at home or in the call centers themselves? It's No, it's a good question. And it's something that, you know, we sort of lived through that, um, that move to work from home. I think, you know, more happened for contact centers and home working in seven days than, had happened in the seven years prior you know I remember for years saying we could have these team working from home and either HR or IT would go no you can't you know there's a risk um but what has it what what's the result at the end of it all for me um what I've seen is you know people got used to being at home and I think at the time during lockdown I had a few people say to me oh all my people are working from home. We're achieving the same sales figures as as we did um, in the office from at home. And I'm thinking, surely not. You can't have, because all of the sales operations that I've run have always been better when you've got a team in the office together. You know, you've got that buzz, you're getting your sales. It, it's infectious, isn't it? It's why people do it. 
so then when you get into this realm of sales centers might want to be back in the office but there's call center jobs where you can be home working a lot of people are going well hang on I like being at home I don't want the commute I don't mm. you know I can I can save that time out of my day if I, if I can just wander up to the spare room and plug in a headset that's great so um you know for me it is harder to get people at the moment to work in the office um and is there a difference in performance theoretically you you might be able to get to the same level of performance but i don't i I've, i'm struggling to see people recreate that buzz that you get on a proper outbound calling floor where you've got everybody in logged in together and you know making stuff happen it's interesting isn't it it's um i guess some people if they're like introverted it might work better for them in some ways if they feel like they're not but then how many of those people i guess want a job doing sort of outbound sales doing outbound sales. i mean the flexibility if you've got peaks you know if if you know your best time to call and you've got a big hole in the middle of the day where you don't really want people sat in your contact center then actually saying to those people well you know work from home you know I remember when I was an agent and there was some of the guys that were on the floor, they were on a split shift. You sort of looking across the floor going, that's unlucky, isn't it? You know, you what does to... that what does that mean, a split shift? So a split shift, so, you know, I'm going back 25 years. I'm not sure people would, um, would do it now in a contact centre, but I worked alongside people who were in for the, you know, 8 a.m. till half, half 11. The morning was busy you know, the age old contact center thing, but it drops quiet in an afternoon and then they would come back and they do the, the other three and a half hours of their shift, you know, up to 9 p.m. at night. So you got this because that's where the, and this was inbound, but you know, that's where the call volume was. So you didn't want people sat about in the middle of the day with nothing to do. Now, you know, I've I've managed uh, client relationships where that's been the case. You know, big peak in the morning, dies off in in the afternoon. Then people get home from work and they want to talk about the you know the the thermostat that's not working and how they can fix it and how they're going to need to reboot the Wi-Fi to make it happen and all that. So you've got those two peaks in demand in the middle of the day. It's dead time. If you can't find enough part timers to fill those two peaks, then ideally you'd want people on a split shift. Not very appealing if you've got to go into the office, but if somebody's happy to, you know, work from home and it fits their lifestyle, well, actually you could have some fantastic salespeople who are, are waiting there untapped thinking, uh, I, and there might be people who used to be in the call center. And, you know, speaking with an outsourcer just this afternoon and um, they were saying by going to work from home model, they've managed to recruit people who are probably a little bit older demographic who might have a load of experience, but might have sort of drifted away from the I don't want to be in the call center anymore. Um, and they're doing great things. You know, just by, you know, more tenure, more experience. And you know, turning out good results makes complete sense because the um, they might have sort of more empathy with some of the people they're speaking to, and more um, more well, similar to them, I guess, in some ways. I, and the other thing is, you know, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm I'm down on the youth of today or anything like that, but you know, if we look at how the world's changed in the last twenty five years. And, you know, what's the average age now that someone buys a house? You know, and I know people go to uni and have, you know, and rent and things like that. But in terms of, you know, a lot of people do that, then move back home with the folks and average age of a first time buyer is something like 33 now. Mm. You, so finding people who have had to, for want of a better term, shop around for a better energy price or a better broadband provider and, and do things like that they, they're not bringing that experience into the workplace with them so you know i think 
if if you can tap into those markets of experience the, you know there's there's good stuff that can be done yeah and you, and like you said it might be really difficult to get them to come into a call center into this sort of buzzing environment surrounded by the youths of today where they're just like i, yeah. I don't want any more baraka and i'm sick of this music Ah, uh, you know, I, 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 rem I remember working in a contact centre once, and we got a proper high energy sales unit at one side of the floor, and then we got um sort of a a, a more, let's say, traditional client at the other side, you know, inbound service calls, and we got the um the guys on the um, service calls, um, the client kicked off, and in the end, we 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 got you know. The, the guys on the sales unit having to do silent applause when they got a sale and it's like it didn't quite work so you know, yeah pick picking who who's best place to work from home or you know do it as an incentive maybe you don't want everybody in the office all of the time but um you know i never quite got my head around the notion of um Oh, if you've made your number by Friday afternoon at two o'clock, you can you can go home. So hang on a moment. We're set. We're sending all our best sellers home on half day because we've we've achieved the number. Maybe maybe there's a different uh, a different model uh, to that that could be uh, applied. You know, maybe it's work from home on a Friday. Incre or it's increasing performance, like based on your previous week's performance, because then you could get the people not doing well to. Do yeah, better. there's got to be better ways. Yeah. So now, obviously, um, the show called B two C lead generation. We look at typically look at the generation, the leads, and the data, and that kind of thing. So, yes. What I want to ask you, and I don't fully know how this works, but from my perspective, I'm quite curious. At what point do you give that? And I'm going to use inverted commas here for, for people listening. The good data um, to agents when they come in. Like, do they have yeah. to earn it? Is something they sort of you get to, in the straightaway to how they do? Like, how how do you navigate that sort of uh, that distribution? That, that is um, that is the eternal dilemma. I've I've worked in situations where it is you know the agents have to earn the good data, so to speak. So you know they they start that journey. You recruit them, train them. You, you know you're telling them what what bonus they can earn and all like that, and then it's almost like but we don't trust you with the good leads. So what we're going to do is give you the cheap stuff. And if you can, if you can get through that and prove that you're doing a good job, then I'll trust you with the good stuff. But if you're not careful, those guys are going to run out of steam before they get to good stuff, you know? So is, is, is there a way that actually you need to be looking and as people are coming on board, you actually do give them, you know, you, you, you're giving them the best possible chance of, of conversion before you um, be, before you sort of get them bored at not getting any sales because what's going to do the confidence good is, you know, getting a sale and then moving on to the next call and, you know, or getting that momentum. And I'm, I'm not sure that, um, you know, for want of a better term, cheaper data or whatever you want to call it is is going to give them that opportunity. Yeah, I've thought the same thing. I remember a few places in the past when we've generated leads and sent them in and they'd have like a tier of agents they were sending them to and the bottom rung would only get the bad data and exactly like you said, it was like, if they can perform on this and you just used to think, but what makes people perform better is confidence. And so the way yeah. to make someone confident is to like give them the good stuff because then it's going to boost their confidence. And then, um, you know, you create this idea of a blend where they, you know, they get boosted at like certain points and they just didn't ever do it. It was like, keep them down, keep them down. So you'll have like, I mean, it's part of the reason I suspect why, I don't know if it's all the same, you might be able to sell us is the churn is so high in a lot of contact centers. But like some of it is obviously they just can't hit the targets and, the bad giving them yeah. all the bad stuff is maybe a big part of that the other yeah. is like their confidence is affected if you just can't cut you know constantly getting no or whatever the negative is and you never rise out of that um yeah 
it's a strange scenario. Considering you're dealing with people, you're using data to actually make them behave in a way that you don't want them to behave. Yeah, I, you know, it, for me, sales is is always about confidence, isn't it? You know, if if you know, you know, I I did a bit of my time doing um, sort of retentions for mobile phones, so if someone got put through to me. And I'd, I'd started that day and I'd done, you know, a, a line advance and, you know, I'm going to show my age. People probably pay more per month for line rental now than, than I used to bill for a year. Um, but, you know, a Nokia 3210 in line advance and, and I could do it at that price. And 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 the customer's like, you know, you're sort of going, why why wouldn't you want this? It's the latest phone and, and I've just knocked this much off your line rental. And they're going, yeah, 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 I'll order that. Well, you're going into the next call, then you're fired up, aren't you? And it's like, yeah, I, I know I can sell this. I'll do another one. Whereas if, if you've got sort of, for want of a better term, questionable data that you've got a low chance of converting, then at that point, you know, am I ever going to get to that level of confidence? Does does that data become sort of a chip? If if it becomes too easy for somebody on on you know the good stuff, you start throwing more of the harder in, and and it's almost like their their pride and and wanting to convert that data kicks in, and you're going, hang on a minute, you know. So should you be putting your more experienced agents on on the harder stuff, or do you know what? Um, I've seen some great examples of people going right. What is that agent best at selling what customers do they sell best to and trying to marry that and for me that that's that's a great way to go if you can get good quality data you've got that amount of information about the customer or prospect and you can go right this this lines up then that surely makes it more of a pleasure for the agent and they're less likely to leave because we're going to be explaining it. Yeah, they're going to. How many contact centers do you have, do you think? Is it rare or is it growing? Or it's, I think it's growing, but I, I still think that there's 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 room for improvement. Mm. You know, I do think that there's there's opportunity out there. Um, but, you know, it's it's been a strange time, hasn't it, with the energy market as it's been and, you know, things sort of, had that bit of a slowdown but it it feels like it's ready to start opening up again yeah you you touched upon something interesting there and i can only really go at this from my own perspective but i know now when i speak to people who call me um from contact centers i can be quite how do i word this <laughs> i can be quite brusque with them sometimes i sort of like it's easy, I think, to forget that there are real people at the end of, of the call when you don't know who they are, they call you. I think, and you were sort of saying about the Nokia 3210 thing there, but like, I guess since that time, people's reactions are a lot different when they're being called. Like, do you find that sort of generally people, agents have a more difficult time these days? And how do you sort of keep morale up when they sort of face that kind of thing? It's a really good point, and it, it you know it immediately brings me back to a call that I dealt with twenty five you know twenty five years ago uh, when I started out, and I, I wasn't long into the job, and the opening words it was an inbound call, but the opening words from the customer were, "Are you the one with the brain cell?" You know <laughs> what? What did you, what did you say? I, I, I think I said something along the lines of I managed to get here this morning, you know, <laughs> but where do you go with that? And, you know, yeah, people, you know, people are busy. And and if, if you're dialing out to someone, uh, you know, and you're looking at, okay, what, what's your connect rate? How often do you actually get to speak to someone? Um, and, you know, people are, less likely to answer the phone these days if it's a number that they don't recognize and then it is yeah people can be like hard and and you know i think that that could be part of the reason why it can be hard to recruit good people and and retain them as well because 
you need a very special kind of agent. And, you know, it's funny, I was speaking to someone the other month and we're chatting along and he went, oh yeah, I used to work in the contact centers. I used to be on outbound selling. And I was like, yeah. And and you could tell because he got that way about him. That, you know, it, it's people got to be resilient and that's that's hard to that can be hard to find these days i think um and you know keeping those spirits up and and i think you know it's 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 beyond the times of just throwing you know sweets and pizza at people uh you know i think you've got to make sure that your people are well supported that they have got opportunity to sort of take a breath between calls um you know if they've got good data and they've got a good commission structure then you know they'll they'll keep going um but i think you know it's it's giving people more care and attention um and talking to people who team leader you know I, the agents have it tough the team leaders have it even tougher because they're that buffer they're in between you know the will of the business and the will of the people so I think having, you know, well-supported team leaders who know that they can do the right thing by their people makes a huge difference as well. Because, you know, I've, I've seen um, dialing, you know, campaigns where actually the, the team leader is making the huge difference because they're having that rapport with the staff. They have, the, the staff know that they're well-supported. Um so I think that's probably a, a key, uh, a key role that's that's often underestimated. And what's um this relationship then, where you have the outsourced partner and you have the client? Yeah. And the outsourced partner has its own internal sort of business needs that you've mentioned, which is probably growth, I'd imagine, and that translates into potential you know the the team leader gets the pressure and then they're trying to like divert it and whatever how involved do the clients get with like the agents in some respects so like you know is there any rapport between them or is it all like at a business level yeah no a bit the best the absolute and probably for you know people who are um uh, Sort of subscribers to to this podcast. If they're on on the client side, as as I call it, the best performing uh, out outsourced contact centers for me are the ones where the client gets involved. So there is a rapport and relationship that um, that transcends all the way through to the agents on the floor. So you know, I I used to run a relationship where my client would be on site, you know, day or two a week, they'd be on the floor, they'd know the agents, they'd speak to them. If the agent had a question about the product that the team leader and, and the outsource team couldn't deal with, they knew that they could go to the client. And the client would say, okay, yeah, well, the, the way that my team sell this or the way, the way that I've sold this in the past is, and this objection we, we've been overcoming it this way um and you know just then when you've got that relationship where the team feel like the you know the clients invested and that you know they're part of that organization then you've it almost moves into another level where the agents want to do well for that person within the client entity as well you know and and we've done you know uh, road shows and things where you've got multiple people from the client's end you take everybody offline you you know you talk to them about what's coming what's the product why why is it better than last year's product and get them really bought into it and you know incentives and it you know what sometimes it might just be silly things it might might be sweets it might be a random trophy but things that people can engage with but ultimately that there's a personal relationship between the, you know the client representative if you like the face of the big brand that is on the floor and speaking to people um i think that shouldn't be underestimated um you know i think 
it's that it's the age old thing with with outsourcing is that you, you know you get out of it what you put in it's interesting so it's like yeah i guess a lot down because of the potential like just even logistics behind it but i remember in the past a few we had clients where we were supplying leads to them and yeah. we used to go and see the sensors and some of them did what you mentioned what i always felt is that the agents at work there actually feel part of the um brand that they're working for so i know everyone does it where they have the brand above it you know and it's yeah. it's kitted out and the colors and everything but then when you've got someone from that company sitting there and as long as they're like engaging it's like yeah. you said you can go up and talk to them about yeah a problem you just had or what someone said or how they'd approach them and they are sort of proactive yeah. with it um that'd be amazing for agents you would think well you know it's so uh, for me um you know what I what I found is very often when you you're running an, an outsource team, if you if if one of those agents was sat in the pub, they bumped into a friend that they'd not seen for years, and you and that friend said, "Where do you work?" I would say as as much as nine times out of ten, the agent would say the name of the client that they were working for, not the name of the outsourcer. Mm. So, and, and and I think outsourcers have made the peace with that now. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't love them and support them. In it. But ultimately, you know, if you've got to the point where the agent's saying, yeah, I work for, and it's the name of the brand that they're dialing for, I think you, you, you're in a good place in terms of that person's loyalty to, to that brand that they're working on behalf of. Yeah, good point. Now, if I want to bring it back around to the podcast title here, yeah, because you mentioned something interesting just there about this almost conflict, the will of the people versus the will of the business. But I'm guessing there's a scenario where both can do well. So what I want to ask you is, especially from the perspective of the brands listening, how can the human element of call centers be used to increase sales? I think ultimately, if the you know the, the brand and if you've got an outsourced partner, making sure that you're aligned in your objectives. So you're starting out at the very you know, hang on a moment. If if we get a sale, what does it mean? You know, but you've got that sort of alignment of you know, we, we're getting to the same point, and you know, you've not got want of a better term friction between the commercial objective of the uh, of the client and of the outsourcer and you know you're not sort of trying to push them too hard so that then you know the people are well looked after because ultimately your your, your human element those agents yeah the outsourcer is going to recruit them they're going to train them they're going to do all that stuff if you consider how long that speed to competence curve is, so how long is it before that agent's doing their best for your brand? You you know, so making sure that there's the right sort of data there, that they can, you know, build that confidence. Um, and, you know, when you get to that point where an agent's been doing something for a while, they know it inside out, but they know any objections they're going to get, and how to handle them. They know what the drop ask or drop off them might be for want of a better term. I think it's it's about committing the right amount of time and energy to it, you know, just to sort of say, oh, we're gonna outsource it. And we expect that, you know, by the end of next week, the outsource team are gonna be performing at the same level as our in-house team who have been doing it for two years. That's not quite gonna work. But you know, there will be things that the outsource provider, you know, the, the management, the wider team should be able to bring in terms of experience from other gigs that they've done, you know. So you bring all that together. But, yeah, it's it's remembering that those, those people in the middle of it, um, if if they're not engaged, you, you're not going to achieve the best results. One thing I wanted to ask you quickly, just for um any companies that supply leads into contact center as well so we talked about how having the brand visible and the 
agent having a relationship with them and the, who do they talk to and then um the human element of potentially making more sales and you know a lot of it seems to be like communication with what they've been taught yeah. and learned do you think like lead generators or the people supplying data to the contact centers should be engaging at an agent level if they're or, or, or you know or, what it's a cracking question it's not one that i'd really thought that much about before but realistically you know it, it it's the age old thing that you know it's always easy for an agent to go oh it's you know it's the data that's not good or it's it's the dial of it's not quite you know people it's it's easy for people to blame the bit that they can't really see so if the data's for want of a better term faceless then it does make it easier for for the agent or the management to go that's bad data that so actually increasing that engagement you know between data provider and and the team on the floor there could be something in that because if you've got the agent sort of going well it's not good data because you said well hang on a minute you know you you're dealing with it wrong or it might be that there's a learning point there so yeah i think it you know the strength of a relationship if you like it, it makes it harder to say oh the data's letting me down if if you've seen the person from the from the data agency going right this is the data this is why this is what so well, no, yeah the, the other thing i was thinking is it it forces more of a commitment in the relationship between that company and the data entity as well like if it's yeah. a lead generator or data because you're not going to wheel people in and then get rid of them a week later yeah. like you're going to have to have really explored yeah. this relationship and be like you know these are the guys that can provide you everything you need to know about the day and they need to know everything you think about it yeah and how we can work together to make it better sort of thing no and and it, it is it's it's you know i can i remember once somebody saying to me you know why have we been sent this data this you know this customer was deceased last time we dialed it and i'm like last time we dialed it yeah we keep records of the fact that we've dialed it yeah hang on a moment um could could we have took that data out of the pot ourselves yeah why didn't we then so you know it, it having the right relationships and the right conversations stops those little own goals as well because you know it must be awful for an agent to ring someone to say oh i want to talk to you about and they go oh yeah he's deceased and i told somebody at your business he was deceased six months i wonder ago. how many agents just got <laughs> no, <laughs> <we're away. laughs> Sorry, wrong number yeah, wrong number <laughs> Yeah, you'd 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 feel a bit that way, wouldn't you? You know, it's it's like so. Yeah, having those close relationships is, can only benefit, can't it? Definitely. I want to um, I want to end this net by looking forward. We look backwards a little bit towards lockdown and how that impacted things. But yeah. what what's what's the current sort of state with that? And how I mean, if you can, if you can. How do you sort of see the next few years for call centers? Can you sort of see things changing or pred any predictions? Oh, crystal wall time. So I think, you know, we so more recently, you know, there is a big push. Um, a lot of businesses are sort of going, how can we manage costs? And, you know, there's been the, you know, bit of a um, bit of a gold rush down to South Africa. You know, people are saying, can we do this in South Africa cheaper than the UK? Um, so, you know, that that's already started. At what point does South Africa get a little bit too busy? And then people start going, well, where next? You know, South Africa aligns fantastically in terms of time of day, culture, you know, so many good reasons. Um, so, you know, there, there's something for me in terms of people will continue as we're in you know i don't think the cost of living things going and interest rates are going down anytime soon so i think you know there's going to be a continued focus there um there's increasing um 
pressure, I suppose, with things like the, you know, the iOS changes to make it easier to block unknown numbers and things like that. So that that's going to make it harder. Does that mean that more people will send a text message the day before saying, we're going to call you tomorrow, save this number because? So, you know, I, is there going to need to be a little more, a little bit more technology involved so that agents have a better chance of speaking to someone? I think, you know, for me, that's that's probably a, a, an area of, of focus in the coming years because it could become very easy for, for people to try and screen out any number dialing them. I oh, so or maybe um a lot of what well, was a few lead generators working on or they're doing already um chatbots. So they yeah. you basically get a um company's information so let's say you were working with an outsource and they're working with a particular brand and you get everything about that brand so let's imagine you could go through their entire customer service questions for the last two years everything yeah. about that company dump it all into um, a database train a chatbot against it and then you generate leads through that chatbot but the, what it's doing is just responding to every question outside of what's your name what's your telephone number and then, you know, they're going, well, I don't know, how much is insurance on a three-year-old, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then this thing can go like, I'll just retrieve that for you now. And it can take it up to a point that either a sale is potentially going to be made or at that point it goes to an agent. Do yeah. you know, like it's that human element. So I've wondered like, is the what's interesting okay. is that, that I, I've not seen it as much in contact centers. I've seen it going to like um, smaller like brands like that yeah. you know where they can book an appointment yeah and because of the dialer technology with a lot of contact centers it's not appointment booking it's like you know it, it goes in the um i forgot what they call it the topper or whatever and then it filters down yeah it, it's it's funny because in terms of the you know the text chat bot if you like but also the voice stuff so I heard a demo last week and literally it, it was sent to me with the, you know, can you, can you spot which one of these is a machine as opposed to a human? 